The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God Ministries is available at www.desiringgod.org. Before I begin tonight, I want to set straight a mistake I made some weeks ago. Um, when we were talking the night between seminars on uh, the foreknowledge controversy, I said something to the effect that John Sanders, who wrote The God Who Risks, had been uh, let go. I don't remember my exact words, let go or fired or was not able to continue teaching at Oak Hills Bible College. That's not true. I have learned subsequently and I got bad information and should have checked it out and didn't. And therefore have been on the phone with him to apologize. And I've called Oak Hills to make sure I can do anything they want me to do to set that straight. So I told both of them I would tell you that it was a mistake and apologize to you for not getting my sources straight. So let us go to school on my mistake here, especially in these very uh, controversial days when we must guard our lips more carefully than ever. So when you hear something... To that effect, um, um, make sure you get it from the horse's mouth. and uh, Because you might even be misunderstanding your source, which is, I think, the case with me. So, I hope that you will learn from my mistake and um, you will not carry that misunderstanding any further. So, we've, I think we're clear, real clear with a brother Sanders. I think we're clear with Oak Hills on the phone with both of them, and uh, now I hope I'm clear with you, and we'll lay that one to rest. If you have any questions about it, um, I'm sorry that I was not more careful to check my sources and be more reticent. Let's pray before we begin tonight. Father, here we are now in our last session together on this particular topic for this particular seminar on manhood and womanhood and biblical perspective here and sexual complementarity. And I know it's been fast and tonight will be fast. And there are vastly more things to see than we've seen. But Lord, I'm, I'm asking that you would take the seeds sown and make them grow into plants of obedience. And grant that you would set us on at least a trajectory of proper inquiry here as a group. So come and help me be efficient and not get bogged down in any rabbit trails. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that there would be a docile spirit in our hearts to comply with your word. And I pray that I would be faithful to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's session is on uh, men and women in ministry, and in particular we'll try to focus on the question of whether or not some roles in leadership in the church are intended by the Bible to be fulfilled by spiritual Christ-like men rather than spiritual Christ-like women. But let me precede that focus on 1 Timothy 2 with just some general thoughts on when men and women in the ministry according to the Bible. These are just general statements that I want to make sure I don't leave unsaid as we get into the nitty gritty of, of exegesis. Number one, all Christians, men and women, are ministers. No one is off duty. All of life should have a radical orientation around the work of the kingdom. Ephesians 4.12, equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and that's men and Women. Every woman and every man should think of himself or herself as a minister. Secondly, ministry is the stewarding of grace through gifts for the demonstration of love and the upbuilding of the faith and the ingathering of God's elect. I base that on 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4.10 is a crucial text for me in this regard. As each has received a gift, use it 
as stewards of the manifold grace of God. Also, 1 Corinthians 12. So gifts are unique, tailor-made enablements given by the Spirit by which you steward grace. So grace comes down, and as it bends out horizontally through you, if there's an anointing from God on that, a unique expression of grace is ministered through you, and that's called ministry. And it's the use of spiritual gifts. Third, all spiritual gifts, though I will argue not all offices or roles, are given to women and are to be used for the good of the church, the reaching of the lost, the glory of God. Four, the office of elder or overseer or pastor, which are interchangeable. We spent a whole weekend, two weekends ago, on this issue. If you want to get those tapes, they'll be ready sometime in the not too distant future. And there you can hear five hours worth of what it means to be an elder, pastor, overseer. The office of pastor or elder or overseer is the responsibility, I'm going to argue, of spiritual men who aim to equip the saints for ministry through the teaching and oversight. First Timothy 2.12 says that this teaching and authority is the unique responsibility of men, not women. Number five. The difference between... An elder and a deacon is the role of teaching and governing. We'll see more of this in a moment. So that the easiest way to apply 1 Timothy 2.12 is to say that the elders of the local church should be men. That's the text we'll spend almost all of our time on tonight. And number six. But the real action, the real ministry in a healthy church is what is happening by the spirit of By the power of the Spirit, through the gifts of the Spirit, in the small groups and the informal times of ministry to one another with words of knowledge, wisdom, gifts, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, mercy, teaching, exhortation, prayer, and all manners of service. In other words, I hope that you will break out of the mold if you're in it which we were for some years in this church, I believe, that ministry means belonging to some committee or board. So that if for some reason you didn't get elected, you were being hindered in ministry. And the mindset should be exactly the opposite. A few poor souls have to serve on committees in order to liberate the saints, men and women, to do what counts in the church committee work is not what counts if it's done right it enables what counts and what counts is what happens out there in the commons afterwards or what happens on a phone call tonight to a, an erring brother or sister or what happens in a in a hospital room or what happens in a confrontation in over lunch for Christ's sake at work or what happens as you write a letter to your erring lost brother or I mean there's a zillion things are what counts and if the elders bury themselves away for two three four hours every three weeks and do their job right that'll happen in a church if they do their job wrong that won't happen in a church to not belong to that little group of 18 guys is not to be evicted from ministry if they're doing their job right and don't have big heads trying to convince everybody that's the ministry Which it isn't. Okay. Now, why I stand by this distinction, just a couple of summary comments here before we look at the text. Why I stand by this distinction in role between men and women in ministry. Number one, because the sense seems plain to me and not terribly complicated in 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 13, where we'll spend our time in just a minute. Number two. Because this fits with the overall picture of complementarity in Genesis and Jesus' ministry and Paul's and Peter's teaching on marriage. And I have never, number three, I have never seen any other texts that contradict this meaning. 
What the other texts do, now here are a few texts, for example, Galatians 3.28, there is neither male nor female. Or Acts 2, where the women are prophesying. What texts like that do is not contradict. If, if you're not bent on finding a contradiction, they don't contradict. They refine our application and protect us from abuses. So the context of Galatians 3.28 is all about salvation there. There's neither male nor female. If you took that as sexually as some do, it would support homosexuality. There's neither male nor female, so when you're looking for a live-in partner, you can choose either sex because there's no male nor female. But we know that's not Paul's intention in view of other things that he says, and we know it's not his intention in the flow of the context there, which is about being clothed with Christ, being children of God, and that's where our equality shines in the presence of God. And in the next two, that women are prophesying, no problem. But if you have women prophesying and then you have women forbidden to do certain kinds of authoritative teaching, you just, instead of saying, ah, see, contradiction, you can't have both texts, you say, okay, then we've got to understand what authoritative teaching are and what prophesying are in a way that coheres here. And that helps you define both of them in a proper way. You don't have to find contradictions if you don't, if you don't want to. So I think these texts liberate in many ways, but they don't have to contradict and they refine and protect us from narrowness and abuses. Number four, the aim of the New Testament is to redeem sin distorted relationships between men and women, but it redeems them by removing the distortions of headship and the distortions of submission, not by leveling all distinctions in role. So, for example, if you say in the church, just like we've argued in marriage, there should be a group of men who should lead and all men and women then follow that leadership. The Bible has lots to say about purifying and refining and defining the nature of that leadership in terms of service. Let the leader be as one who serves Luke twenty two twenty six. But as I said two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when Jesus got on the floor, took off his outer garment, bound a towel around and washed the disciples feet as a slave. Nobody doubted for a moment who the leader was in that room at that moment. So to define leadership as servanthood is not to abolish leadership by servanthood. Is that clear? And I think the Bible is bent on helping us rescue submission from mindless subservience and rescue leadership from uh, domination and abuse and control. Number five. Since I see this distinction in the Bible, I believe it is good for women and men and for our society as a whole and for the glory of God. So those are five reasons why I believe what I believe, why I stand here, why I teach these things. Now we go to the text, at least one text tonight. And this is the main one. And so we're going to spend most of our time on it. First Timothy chapter two. And uh, the reason I included verses one and two along with 8 to 15 is because there's a link up in this word quiet that I'm going to need to pull down in order to help shed light on the meaning of the key verses, which are 12 and 13. So let's read this unit together here. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now dropping to verse 8. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women 
to adorn themselves with proper clothing and modestly and just modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. For if for it was Adam who was created first, first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with discretion. Now, you couldn't ask for a more politically incorrect passage in the universe. This is a unbelievably out of step text in our day. I mean, any pastor who preaches on this deserves a medal and a shield. So I am not naive that the way this sounds in our culture is uh, questionable, to put it mildly. So let's try to tackle at least three things. What does quiet mean? What does submission mean? And what kind of teaching and authority are forbidden? Those would be my three questions tonight that I'd like to try to work through exegetically with you. And then if we have time, we'll we'll tackle verse 15. I don't think verse 15 is is as hard as some make it out to be, but um, we'll see if we have time for that. I think it's more important that we we try to understand the limits that are placed here and the freedoms that are manifest there. So first of all, let's take the term uh, silence. A woman is to learn is to learn quietly receive instruction or quietly Learn. So the context here is one of receiving instruction. It's the gathered community to be taught by someone. And he asks that the women be quiet. And he refers to it here in verse 12. Remain quiet. And he refers to it here. Now, first observation I'm going to make is this wider contextual one with this word back up here. This quiet word in verse 2. You see, Hesu Kion. And then here, I should have put it here. It's the same word here. Hesukia, different ending. And it's the same word right here. Quietly, quietly. So my first clue as to how narrow to interpret the word quiet. You, you women were singing a minute ago. Is that excluded? And um, can, can a woman ask questions here? And so on. Those kinds of questions might arise in your mind. You say, well, what do you mean quiet? Well, here... Um, Leading a life that is tranquil and quiet uh, probably doesn't mean that you're leading a life where you don't say anything. It more has to do with that quietness in the sense of unruffled, tranquil, peaceful. So it sounds like this word in the context here has a ring not of silence, no talking, but of that wider sense of quietness in the community. We want not a loud, boisterous, troubled life. We want a tranquil, quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So my first clue that that's probably the drift here is that context. The second thing to notice here is that um, this but puts the silence in verse 12, the quietness, over against the exercise of authority. Allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain hesukia, to remain quiet. Now, that here's the way I would paraphrase that. Um, so what sort of quietness does Paul have in mind? It's the kind of quietness that respects and honors the leadership of the men God has called to oversee the church. Because that's what's being 
contrasted here. He's got men teaching and exercising this authority, and he wants the women to be, instead of doing that, remain quiet. So it's a kind of quietness that respects that kind of leadership by the men. Verse 11 says that the quietness is in all submissiveness. Verse 12 says the quietness is the opposite of authority over men. I didn't draw your attention to that. Quietly receive instruction with all or entire submissiveness. So it's, it's the kind of quietness that renders submission to this teaching. So the opposite would be saying things or making noises that belittles that teaching or that authority that calls it into question that says, I don't want to be led and I don't want to have men serving in that capacity. That would be the kind of thing coming out of a mouth that would be the opposite of Hesukia or quietness. So the point seems not whether woman says nothing because we have. I'm going to show you in just a minute when we talk about the parameters of teaching that there's lots of women talk in the New Testament. So it's not total silence, it seems to me. But a submissive spirit and whether she supports the authority of the men, God is called to oversee the church. So quietness means not speaking out in a way that compromises that authority. That'd be my definition. Not speaking out in a way that compromises this exercise of authority or this exercise of teaching here. So that's my effort to try to balance the natural inclination to take this word to mean too much with what we know, according to other teachings in the New Testament, as well as the context here, I think, is its more acceptable New Testament meaning. Second question or second observation or focus teaching what what is being forbidden here when he when he says I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over men well, let's ask this question first um, are there any in in this letter and in the other pastoral letters as well as the wider New Testament are is there any teaching being done by women that we can bring alongside this and say, well, probably then he doesn't mean all teach is ruled out. And, and I've got three observations on that. For example, Titus 2, 3. Uh, Paul says that the older women are to teach the teach the younger women. And at the end of the verse, they are to teach what is good. And so train the younger women to love their husbands and children, etc. So there you have a, a concrete particular instance in Titus, which is very closely related to First Timothy, uh, saying, well, there is at least at least one place where we have women teaching. They teach the younger women, pass on the truth to them about life and about family and about whatever else should be passed on from woman to woman. Second observation. Second Timothy 3.14 tells us that um, Timothy is to remember from whom he learned the scriptures. He's using this as an argument for why he should hold fast to the scriptures. And he says, now remember the kind of person from whom you learned them. And who does he have in mind? Well, we know... From chapter 1, verse 5, he has in mind Eunice and Lois, his mother and his grandmother. His father was a pagan. He wasn't even a Jew. And so that father didn't have any knowledge of the scriptures and he didn't want to have any, evidently. I don't know what happened to him later, but at least from Acts 14, I mean, Acts 16, 3, when Timothy was called into Paul's apostolic band, it says his father was a Greek. And that's why he circumcised Timothy in order to avoid any kind of misunderstanding there. And um, so he got his teaching from his mother and his grandmother. And Paul even is willing to say, remember from whom you learned the scriptures when you were a boy. So the second kind of teaching that we have that women are doing in the pastoral epistles is the teaching of their children. Here's the third instance. 
In Acts 18.26, you have Priscilla and Aquila uh, going to the place of Apollos when they heard Apollos is preaching. And Apollos didn't have a few things right, they noticed. So the verse says in Acts 18.26, when Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos, they took him and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. They took him and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. So the picture we have is a couple goes to a man's house. Knock, knock. We heard your sermon this morning. Can we talk? Um, and they sit down and she's there and he's there and they start talking. And there's no no statement. She didn't say a word. He did all the talking or that she did all the talking and he didn't say a word. It's just that together a husband and a wife went and confronted a man and uh, helped him get some doctrine right here. So a third thing besides women teaching women and women teaching children, you have a couple in some kind of teamwork ministering to a man to get his thinking right in that kind of small group setting, at least. Now, what that does for me is uh, cause me to come to this text and read I do not allow a woman to teach. Okay. To to give Paul the benefit of the doubt here now, that he's not talking out of both sides of his mouth, I say, okay, you must have in your mind then a, a particular kind of teaching here rather than just a sweeping statement because there are other instances where uh, you yourself have not only commanded older women to teach younger women and commended Eunice and uh, Lois for doing a good job teaching their child. Uh, and you know about Priscilla and Aquila. So what's what's the focus here, Paul? What, what are you getting at? What, how are we supposed to take this word? Are there any parameters to it at all that you can help us with? Um, and I think the best way to handle a question like that is uh, not to say, as some egalitarians would, well, see, it, it, it must have been some kind of special situation here in Ephesus. And there's no real application that you can make to this day because uh, clearly women taught in the New Testament. And so they should teach in all circumstances today. Now, that seems to me to be a precipitous leap out of the context. What I would suggest is that we stay right here and just ask whether this wouldn't be a more careful and faithful reading. I don't allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Would it not be fair then to suggest that perhaps what Paul means is the kind of teaching I don't permit is the kind that exercises authority over man. So that these two things, teach and exercise authority, are so closely unified that they inform each other. In fact, I'll just give you my progress of thought as I've been working through this over the years. I got to this point and I began to think, okay, if if they're closely connected and Paul means for them to inform each other and maybe say one thing here instead of just two things, is there any evidence for that or clue for that somewhere? And here's what I found. I found that these two things, teaching and authority, are the very two things in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy that distinguish a deacon from an elder. I said, that's interesting. That in the list of qualifications, an elder must be apt to teach, whereas a deacon does not have to be apt to teach. And elders... Govern well. I'm getting this now from 1 Timothy 5.17. Let the elders who govern well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So you have this double function of elders, namely they govern or have authority and they teach or preach. And then I come back here and I notice those are the very two things that he proscribes. From women. And I ask him, is that an accident? And, and my conclusion is, no, it's probably not an accident. And therefore, in all likelihood, what this unit, teach and have authority, mean is 
these are the these are, this is the description of an elder as opposed to a deacon. And so in a nutshell, I would say this text means I don't allow a woman to serve as an elder. Just in a nutshell, that's what I think it means. And by I mean, if your church, for example, doesn't have elders, say, oh, our church doesn't have elders, so there's no problem there. <laughs> Women can do anything at our church. Well, that's just a matter of words. You have to ask, what's the faithful counterpart in your setting to an elder? If you don't have any, you got a defective structure. <laughs> you don't have to call them elders if you don't want to, but there needs to be something like that in your church so that it's a biblically structured church. And so it seems to me that if you stay with the context here and you recognize that there is a kind of teaching that's endorsed and commanded to women elsewhere and you let this proximity of authority here inform what the teaching is and then you you go to chapter three and you go to chapter five and you notice that the elders are distinguished from the deacons by those two things. The elders teach, the elders rule, deacons don't teach, deacons don't have rule. We at Bethlehem, as we passed through a study of this and wrote our constitution about 10 years ago, um, we did something uh, narrowing and broadening. We created elders. We didn't have elders before, so we now have a council of elders. And we wrote in, these will be spiritual men. And deacons, who were all men here when I came and had to be men, were said to be Women and men. So that's the way our constitution is written now. Elders are men. Deacons can be women or men here. We don't have the deacon S. We, you can put that word on the end. There's no Greek. There's no Greek corresponding to deacon S or deacon. It's just one word. And so that's the way we have landed. And, you know, you got to wherever church you come from. If you're not a Bethlehem person, you got to work that through in terms of the structures that you you have. So now there's my answer to the second issue. What are the parameters of teaching? Now, there, I know there are a lot of gray areas here. Lots of gray areas. Like, I, mean, I could list them off for you. InterVarsity chapters. Adult Sunday school classes. When does a guy become a man? Can you teach high schoolers? Can you teach university? This is a zillion gray areas. And frankly, I just don't want to fight over those. As a local body, you just got to decide where you draw certain lines and you live with that. You may adjust over the years. And uh, you'll always live with ambiguity. And that's just life. So I, I just want to have a few things clear. If we can have a few things clear, you're already in so much trouble already <laughs> that the ambiguities can just be laid aside. If I can just win just a few key battles of interpretation and say, at least in every church, there should be a a core, a camaraderie of spiritual, Christ-like, humble, servant men who are willing to lay down their lives to lead this church at whatever cost. And you can hear I'm choosing language that makes it sound real good. Because I believe that's exactly the way God wants it to sound. And you have a church full of women who say, I love the leadership of this church. I am so glad the men of this church are of that quality. I'm glad. And that's the kind of church I want to have. I want to, I want to be that kind of man. I want to assemble around me those kind of elders so that the women in this church flourish under that. And they say, amen, amen. We want that kind of men to lead this church. And, and of course, if we're squelching them and ruining their ministries and, and preventing them from finding their gifts, then they're not going to be excited about that at all. And we're not doing our job. But I think in a good church, godly, mature Biblical women really thrive when led by humble, godly, teachable, open, strong, visionary, Christ-like men. So that's what our aim is. Whether we attain it or not, I'm not sure. We work at it. Third uh, observation. What about submission and authority? Basically, what I do with these two words, authority and submission, is exactly the same thing I do with headship and submission in the home. And I think there's a correlation there that moving back and forth between home and church should be a real natural feel for people. I know that there are teachers, for example, uh, Roger Nicole. I love Roger Nicole's theology. He's Calvinist through and through. And on this issue, we part company 
halfway into it. <laughs> and I had him come speak here at one of our pastor's conference. Roger Nicole argues exactly what I argue in Ephesians 5. In the family, man is head, woman affirms that headship, flourishes in it. And then when he gets to this text, he goes haywire. <laughs> My interpretation, <laughs> haywire. Because he, 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 does, he just argues this is local, this is cultural, and uh, this doesn't have any abiding value. And so uh, women can be pastors and women can be elders. So I asked him, I asked him at a table sitting in that room about 10 years ago. I said, so your wife must submit to you at home and follow you as her leader. But she could be the pastor of your church. And he said, yes, no problem. <laughs> I think that's a problem. But you need to know there are people that don't think that's a problem. And so now, you know, uh, I don't think Roger has written a book on this. Uh, he may have written articles on it. And you can find him. He's an oddball because most I say an oddball in the good sense in that he, he believes half of the complementarity thing, whereas most egalitarians sweep it all away. That is, this text goes and Ephesians 5 goes. And all you have left is, is uh, um, mutuality. No hierarchy at all in terms of headship and submission. So here, all I want to say is that this authority here is the authority of a Christ-like servant leader. This is servant leadership, not um, authoritarianism or coercive or suppressive or manipulative or unhearing or unlistening or unteachable or uncorrectable above rebuke. None of those things should be in this. Because elders are sinners in the Bible. This book right here, chapter 5, makes a provision for rebuking an elder. And then submissiveness would be the same thing, the, the enthusiastic support of that leadership. Not the mindless support of it, because probably, in my view anyway, in the congregational life of the church, it is the whole body of believers who wind up doing the discipline if there has to be some done. On a wayward, out-of-control elder. Um, so, here's my definition of authority. Authority refers to the divine calling of spiritual gifted men to take primary responsibility. Notice the word primary, again, as with husbands, not soul. Primary responsibility as elders for Christ-like servant leadership and teaching in the church. That's my definition of authority. Here's my definition of submission in the church. Submission refers to the divine calling of the rest of the church, both men and women, to honor and affirm the leadership and teaching of the elders and to be equipped by it for the hundreds and hundreds of various ministries available to men and women in the service of Christ. And that last point is real important to me. Um, for men and women who have a heart to minister, save souls, heal broken lives, resist the devil, meet needs. There are fields of opportunity that are simply endless. And God intends for the whole church to be on active duty. Nobody, male or female, slouching around doing nothing. Nobody at home wasting their lives watching soaps and reruns. While the world burns. You know, one of the saddest things, um, and, I, and I, I, I say this, I hope I can say it carefully so you don't misunderstand me. One of the saddest things, which is now being reversed of the last 20 years, as women have been told over and over again by feminists that the only respectable life is in the marketplace. One of the saddest things about that and a diminishing of the value of homemaking and mothering is that a massive resource of creative, energetic volunteerism vanished. Women ran things once upon a time. 
That is, they, they undertook all kinds of creative service ministries in community and lifted the whole life of a community because they had, if they were really effective in their parenting, and even if they had five or ten kids, they had time. If they were good time managers, they time and they could have the older daughters take care of the little kids and they could take two, three hours in the middle of the day and make something happen in the community. Get somebody elected or, or get homes mothers helped or get drugs out of this neighborhood or and then they got sold this bill of goods that the, that the only respectable way to spend a life is making money in a, at a desk somewhere or in front of a computer or or whatever and and they were exhausted when they came home and they had the kids now the daycare and they feel guilty because they want to spend time with the kids and they can hardly handle what they're doing and their husbands are dog tired and air at each other and this is not your great life this is not wonderful suburbia you just can afford a home that then you got to keep working to pay the the uh, mortgage on and so you're 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 enslaved well, I'm just so thankful that a lot of women have gotten the boldness to stand up and say, the superwoman was a bill of goods, and there is a noble calling in homemaking and community life and church life that is so rich and so full, and some women are writing about it, and more women, like the women in this room right now, need to get on a soapbox and preach it. Preach it, P-R-E-A-C-H. Preach it. So that more younger women coming along dream their own dreams and don't feel like they're coerced in their college years to say, well, they say, uh, what are you planning on? Um, I kind of like to get married and make a home for a guy that I admire. <laughs> now, we've got a system in this culture that is just broken. It doesn't work. Because a woman can't count on that happening. There's no parents who can make that happen. In, in some cultures, you can make that happen. So every woman must plan her life that way. And I know the dreams of many. They wish that the long term were, I would like to find a man whose life I can pour my life into and raise a family and make a home and breed radical disciples for Jesus and be freed in the community to use my gifts at church and home and community to make all kinds of good things happen and win people to Christ and heal the broken. I mean, that is a noble calling. And I wish there were ways we could make the system work better. If you have ideas, let me know. So I could go one or two ways right here in our last two, three, four, five minutes together. Um, I could tell you what I think verse 15 means or, or, or the argument in verses 13 and 14. Or I could open it for questions. You know, I really haven't even done 13 and 14, let alone 15, have I? I think I better sum this up because to leave you without that argument right there is uh, irresponsible. What does this mean? For... It was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who deceived. So he's got two arguments. The reason I do not think this text is culturally limited is because his arguments are rooted in creation and the fall, not in any cultural situation. I'm not persuaded by any of the sophisticated arguments to the effect that in Ephesus there was this problem or that problem. And so none of this really applies to today because it only applies to Ephesus because his argument for... It was Adam who was created first and then Eve. So I take you back four weeks. I lay my argument before you. I gave you 11 arguments, I think. Nine or 11 arguments. It was nine. Um, why I think this is not an off-the-wall statement. That when Paul read the first three chapters of Genesis, he saw a pattern of leadership before and after the fall. And he's saying here that pattern of leadership establishes this priority of the church. Being led by men. And women and men following those leaders. The second argument. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression is more difficult. Historically, and you can see why that's been taken to mean women are more deceivable than men. 
and therefore need to be led by men at the spiritual level of the church's life. That may be true. I suspect men are more deceivable in some ways and women are more deceivable in some ways. I suspect women can see through certain scams that men fall for and men can see through certain scams that women fall for. I suspect that's the case. You studied very carefully and you made proper distinctions. And if that's the meaning here, what Paul would be saying then is on a certain kind of deceivability scale, we need the men leading the doctrinal charge of the church. However, I'm just not persuaded that that's what this text means because of the exegesis I developed of the fall four weeks ago. And I know I'm expecting a lot for you to remember it, but you remember what happened. Satan approaches the woman. The man is there. He's listening and he's not intervening. He's silent and God criticizes him for being silent and listening later in chapter three. And so Satan assaults God's intended leadership of the man by ignoring him and addressing the woman. She and he fall for it. And when they fall for it, the reversal of this order, I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority, creates a collapse of the right ordering of life at home and in God's people. So, might it not be then that verse 14 means something like this? Let me see if I can just read my paraphrase, lest I use too many words. Here's what I would say, suggest. Adam was not deceived. What's that mean? Parenthesis. That is, Adam was not approached by the deceiver and did not carry on direct dealings with the deceiver. Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. What's that mean? That is, she was the one who took up dealings with the deceiver and was lit and was led through her direct interaction with him into deception and transgression. So the I'm saying that the point here may be, and I'm inclined to think that it is, is that when Satan assaulted God's divine ordering of things, he did so such that he put the woman in the place of the interactor with the deceiver. He approached the woman, you deal with me. I don't tell you I'm deceiver, but I am deceiver. I don't want you to interact with me. I'm not going to interact with him. And she did that. And with the man, he didn't interact with him. He just stood there and listened. And she fell into transgression and the man fell with her. But the reason he points it out as relevant for this, the woman falling into transgression, it was, is because it was Satan's assault on this ordering. The leadership of the man that brought the whole thing crashing down. Now, if that's not what it means, then I'm cast back on the traditional interpretation, which I'm willing to be cast back on to. But I think in either case, it is warranted from the original Genesis situation rather than any cultural situation in Ephesus. One last content, comment about verse 15. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with discretion. And I'll close with this. What does that mean? What does saved through childbearing mean? Women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with discretion. I put the Greek up here. Women will be saved. This is the word saved. Through dia, tes, technogonias, through childbearing. What does that mean? We'll be saved through childbearing. Here's what I think it means, and, and I base some of it on this analogy with 1 Corinthians 3.15. The situation, I think, is 
Women contemplate the pain of childbirth in that culture, which was a thousand times worse than it is today. And they read Genesis 3, where it says, as a result of the curse, women shall give birth in pain. So they, they feel this is judgment. This is God's judgment on me. And women died in childbirth. They died in childbirth. Lots more than they do today. And today in other cultures, they die in childbirth much more frequently. So to this pain thing and this curse thing weighed heavily, I think, on women. Is God against me? Does he care about me? Will he save me? Save me? Does he have any place for women in his salvation? And so through childbirth, this through here is like fire <laughs> through fire. In spite of childbirth. In other words, I'm in, entering into the curse, into judgment it feels like. And will I make it through? Will God condemn me? Is, is this a sign that he condemns me? Will I make it through? Then the text says, you will be saved right through the burden of the curse of childbearing if you believe. You're saved by faith. If you love, if you're holy, and manifest that in discretion. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.15 is the only other place in the New Testament where this verb and this preposition occur in a similar way. And the context is, uh, he will be saved thus as through fire. So the through fire is a... Judgment like testing and you make it through. And so childbirth would be a judgment like testing and you make it through if you have faith and love and holiness. And I just put faith and love and holiness and gave verses to say that's no different than the way men get saved. Men are saved if they have faith and love and holiness with discretion. All those three words are made conditions of our salvation. Romans 5, 1, by faith that we say, or just, we're justified by faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if you have no love for the Lord, then be accursed. And um, Romans 6, 22, that holiness that leads to eternal life. So let me see if I can end this uh, and then stand here afterwards for any of you who want to come up and ask questions um, that I didn't get to. You'd hoped I would or clarifications or applications I'll be happy to stay as long as you want tonight but I, what I hope has happened in these uh, four five weeks we've had together is that um, you've seen at least a plausible and credible uh, interpretation of texts and a, a paradigm of ministry that I hope is not off-putting because I think God wants men and women to feel excited about Headship in marriage and spiritual leadership of men in the church. I think they, he wants it to feel freeing to us and liberating and mobilizing for men and women so that nobody goes out of this room or out of the church saying, I'm cramped and I'm, I can't do what I really feel I'm called to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, take, I pray, my uh, efforts to push this into a very small space of time and refine it in people's minds and hearts, I pray, and make us uh, a kind of people here at Bethlehem and the other churches represented here such that we build marriages and we build uh, a camaraderie between men and women in ministry in our churches that are so wonderfully mobilizing and liberating and freeing and refreshing and fruit bearing and God glorifying that we just don't spend a lot of time worrying about the steps of the dance. Grant that the uh, dance would be so beautiful that the world would see and say, well, I thought headship and submission was an ugly thing. I thought the leadership of men was an abusive thing. But here I see it's refreshing and rings deep in my soul. With the way I'm created to be. Lord, I pray that that would be the effect far and wide. 
for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message by John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org. There you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and much more, all available to you at no charge. Our online store carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources. You can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org. Or call us toll-free at 1-888-346-4700. Our mailing address is Desiring God, 2601 East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55406. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure, because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.